Did you know that Alaskans just celebrated the 50th running of the Iditarod? That famous race from Anchorage to Nome that started with a plague and antibiotics uh, over 100 years ago, 50th running of that race. It's a thousand, nearly a thousand mile race that snakes along Alaska's a coastal untamed wilderness, pitting man and beast against the elements. And musher Brent Sauce took the top prize, his first in seven tries this year, just last month. And he did it in eight days and 14 hours. But he would be the first to tell you he couldn't have done it without his team. He says, I am super, super, super proud of this dog team. It's all on them. They did an excellent job the whole race. I asked a lot of them, and they performed perfectly. Rosas took command early in the race, and nobody ever really challenged him. He was almost a day ahead by the time he reached the last checkpoint before going into Nome. But he did say that the final stretch of the race might have been the toughest because as he neared Nome and was going through the Bering Sea ice toward the town, that's when the extreme winds were blowing in off the sea. And uh, at one point, just a few miles left in the race, he stumbled or tumbled and the, the dog sled and the dogs went off the trail in the middle of the night. He says, I couldn't see anything. The only reason we got out of there is because of the dogs. They trusted me to get them back on the trail. And once we got back on the trail, they just took off 100 miles an hour again. And we were able to stay on the trail and get in here. It was a lot of work. And I say to Brent, you can have all of that. I'll just read about it. Brent Soss, would he be the first to tell you that in any major enterprise, it takes a good team? But did you know that the Bible said this years ago when God was dealing with the Israelites in the wilderness, he set Moses up to learn the importance of establishing a good team, which is the title of the message today, The Value of Team. The Value of Team. And Moses got the advice in a different way. He got it from his father-in-law of all places. Would you look with me? This is Exodus chapter 18, beginning in verse 7. You look at your text or on the screen, whatever's easier for you. The Bible says, And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him. That means he showed respect. And they asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and, for, and all the travail or hardship that had come upon them by the way and how the Lord delivered them. What a testimony that is for God's people. As we journey through the wilderness, we do experience travail and hardship. But we also have this epitaph at the end of this verse, but the Lord delivered them. And that's what the people of God learn, right? God is able to deliver us. Verse 9, And Jethro, that's the name of Moses' father-in-law, rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done in Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. Now I have a question for you. Why did Moses' father-in-law come to see him in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula? Maybe you wonder sometimes why your in-laws show up at the front door too. <laughs> Well, there were kids involved. That's always the reason the in-laws come, right? Kids. The first part of the chapter reveals that Jethro was bringing back Zipporah, this is Moses' wife, and their two children, Gershom and Eliezer, who had been left behind while Moses was on his journey to confront Pharaoh to go through the ten plagues and to bring Israel across the Red Sea into the Sinai Peninsula. So it was time now for the family to be brought back to Moses, and so that's why Jethro's there. He's kind of been the guardian looking after the family while Moses has been away. And Moses could have taken, as you might expect with family in town visiting, he might have just taken the week off. 
But instead, a day after his visit, he sits down, Moses does, to judge the people. That is, he, he works. And while he works, Jethro watches. And while Jethro watches, by the end of the day, he has a few words he wants to share with his son-in-law about some things that need to be fixed. Look at verse 13. I'm condensing for sake of time. Verse 13 says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. This is the common way to, to approach a dignitary at this time. The dignitary is sitting down, and the people in the court are standing up before them, which happens in a courtroom today, right? The judge is usually sitting behind the bench, and the plaintiff and the defendant are before him. Verse number 14, And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning until even? Well, that's not going well. Verse number 17 says, Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Well, this is much bigger than a little spat between a father-in-law and a son-in-law. As we're about to see, God is actually laying out a program, albeit from an unusual source, a program about how to get God's work done in a more effective way, the value of a team. Let's look closer at the advice then today. Number one, the weight of bearing the work alone, which is Jethro's first piece of advice to his son-in-law, listen, there's, you're carrying way too much weight here. I've already mentioned in this series that there are approximately 2 million people. We don't know exactly. We do know there were about 600,000 men, 20 years and older, who were registered in a census in the wilderness. That does not include women and children. So 2 million people is a reasonable figure for the total number of people traveling through the wilderness. For him to be responsible for that many people, this is twice the population of the Tucson metro area. This is a huge group of people to manage in one courtroom with one judge. And so verse number 14, Moses' father-in-law Jethro asks him a, co a couple of questions. Jethro's questions are these. What is this thing that thou doest to the people? What are you doing? Why sittest thyself alone and all the people stand by thee from morning until evening? Let me put this in the colloquial for today. What in the world are you thinking? <laughs> Why are you managing this great multitude this way? Have you lost your mind? That's what a father-in-law would say today. <laughs> Moses' explanation follows in verses 15 and 16. Moses said unto his father-in-law, you know, he's got to defend himself. Well, because the people come unto me, they ask, they're inquiring about God to inquire of God. When they, they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another. And, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. You know, I got this important job. I got to tell them what God says. You know, who's going to do that? In Jethro's assessment, again, in verse 17, the thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Notice he identifies in Jethro's assessment two problems. One's affecting the people. Number one, the people are getting worn out. There we go. People are wearing, you're wearing everybody out by doing it this way. Surely you wear away thou and the people. And then number two, also a problem for him, the weight is too heavy. He says in verse number 18, this thing is too heavy for thee. So Jethro was sure that Moses was beating a path to an early grave. If he didn't immediately change his procedure, he was going to certainly die because of the length, the, the magnitude, rather, of the caseload. Now, for some reason, we have a way of seeing this in other people's lives in a way that we don't see it in our own life. He works too much, you know, and the guy's just cruising along. He's... But that's the way it is, isn't it? We typically see problems in other people's lives a lot more easily than we see them in our own lives. So allow me to give you some examples or illustrations of people today who might be in the same predicament that Moses was with his father-in-law. You know, at the top of my list of amazing people are moms. 
Moms are amazing people. How they're able to juggle their schedule and to put two or three or more children along that they're responsible for, and at the same time to know exactly where everyone's things are in the house at any given moment. Mom, where are my cleats? And they have that responsibility. Some, many moms have work outside the home that they're juggling too, and moms are just amazing people. And if anybody is under a lot of weight, I would definitely say moms would be in that category. But even moms need the support. You know, in an ideal family, the way God set the whole thing up, it's not good for one parent to be responsible for the children. That's why he put two parents in a home, ideally. I understand that doesn't always happen in circumstances in life, but that really is God's design because no per one person can carry the weight is too much to bear. You know, another group of people I think about when it comes to this is I think about pastors. I think there are a lot of good shepherds out there, and they mean well, but they often carry too much. They try to do too much because they care so much for the flock, and they're just running and running and running and running. Pastors are trying to do, and you know, and some people, you know, our pastor can't say no. Well, you know what? If you're a shepherd and you're caring for the sheep, which sheep do you tell no? I mean, how do you do that? So as a, as a pastor, you just keep going and going, and you throw rental properties in there on top of that, and then you just got all kinds of issues going on. You know, there's another group of people, I think, that would be in a similar circumstance to, to Moses, and, and that would be, you know, small business owners. You know, if you have a business, a home business, or responsible for a personal business, I mean, who else is going to make sure that the work gets done, that the payroll gets out, that that the customers are happy and that they choose to come back to your business again and again, which is what you need for your business to go. And so often small business owners, they'll work the extra shift, they'll go the extra mile, and they're there hour upon hour just trying to get it done. It's hard to find good help in a small business. I think these are, maybe you can think of some others, but there are people today, perhaps right in this church, that are feeling the weight of so much, moms and pastors and small business owners and Maybe I didn't land on your particular, but it is easy to try to carry too much of the weight of the work alone, which was Moses' problem. Now, before I move on, I want to double down for just a moment on this idea of whether or not you're carrying too much weight. Now, some of you are retired, so you're not feeling quite the pressure. <laughs> Though there are some people that have found a way to work harder in retirement than they did when they were employed. I don't understand that, but anyway... Let me just ask you to do some self-assessment here about whether or not you might be in the same category that Jethro is dealing with Moses here. And let me just ask you some questions, all right? The first one is this. Are you working presently more than 50 to 60 hours a week? Is that your normal schedule? Are you unable to relax when you get home and get a full night's sleep? Are you moody? and irritable around people? Are you easily annoyed by those who disrupt your schedule or slow you down? Those are all kinds of indicators that you're carrying maybe just a little bit too much on your plate. A little girl was playing at the beach one day and she found a little hermit crab and she was watching it and playing with it and uh, she noticed that with the hermit crab, everywhere he went, he carried his shell or his home along with him wherever he went. At one point while she was playing, she said to her daddy, Daddy, every time that crab moves, he has to carry his house with him. You know, some people live like that. They live like they're carrying their house around with them. And that's just too big of weight for any person to carry. So what can you do about it? What should you, as a believer, as a Christian, do about the pressures that we all carry in life so that we don't end up living frustrated, crabby lives? <laughs> all right, there is a solution. That's where I want to spend most of my time. Let's go to point number two today, the wisdom of building a team. The wisdom of building a team. This is where... Jethro really begins to shine. Outside this chapter, we know very little about Jethro. In verse number one, we know that he was a priest of Midian, so he had some rank or position. 
He's been around a while, so he, he's older than, than Moses. He has some knowledge to share. He, he says, I want to talk to you, Moses, about building a team. Look with me at verse number 19 where he picks up this part of the, the advice. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. All right, let's break down Jethro's advice into a couple of parts, just for the sake of being clear. All right, I want you to build a team, Moses. How do you do this? Letter A, let's talk about the mechanics. How do you go about building a team? All right, so you're, in a, you're a small business owner. You have a position in church. You, you, you're a mom, and you're managing a bunch of different lives. How do you do, go about the mechanics of building a team? Number one, do the main thing. This is what Jethro first says to Moses in verses 19 and 20. You know, you have to be to the, your people Godward. There, there's certain things you can't give away. You know, there's certain things people can't give away. It's their main job. Parents can't give away the instruction and discipline of their children. That's their main job. Pastors can't give away praying for their flock and preaching the word. That's the main job. And, and the apostle said in Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, we will give ourselves continually to these things. Why? Because that's the main job. What's another thing I have here listed? Sunday school and children's church teachers, they can't give away the Bible lesson to someone else. That's the main part of the teaching hour. So it's the main thing. So there's some things you can't give away. You have to do the main thing. Max Lucado, some of you have read his books at I've read a, 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 a handful of them. In his book, Cure for the Common Life, he writes, do most what you do best. You know, and that is very applicable to the church of God and the people of God. You ought to spend most of your time and most of your effort doing what you do best. Do the main thing. And that really is helpful because as you think about what the Lord has called you to do or what He's asked you to do. That's the thing you need to double down on and you need to start cutting away the peripheries of the things that we typically get ourselves wrapped up in. What a, what a profound truth it is then to give yourself to the main thing. All of us, especially moms, are running around tying up loose ends. And there will always be loose ends to tie up. But a person shouldn't think of himself as indispensable or that nobody else can do the same kind of work. When it comes, though, to the bulk of what you do, make sure you double down on what only you can do. This, this applies to spiritual gifts, incidentally, in Romans chapter 12. You know, Paul says, if you're a giver, do what? Give. Hey, if you're full of mercy, you know what you ought to do? Romans 12, share it with cheerfulness. Double down on mercy. Hey, and if you're a teacher, you ought to teach. And if you're gifted to serve, go serve. That's what you're good at. That's the main thing. Go after it. Hey, and if you're a talker, make sure in your talking, you talk up Jesus. Do the main thing. The second thing he tells Moses to do here when it comes to building a team is, number one, do the main thing. And number two, find good men. Look at verse 21 if you're following in the text or on the screen. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. What kind of men is he looking for? Well, he's looking for ones that fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of ten. If you're going to build a team, you've got to find good people to put on your team. This is how we pick teams back in the day, right? You stand people up on the line, you pick the best players for your team if you're one of the captains. So you've got to pick good men. And he lists here those who fear God. That's, that's people who uh, want to stay right with God and avoid evil. And fear of God or stepping out of line with God motivates them to stay on the right course. Love truth. Knows the difference between black and white, right and wrong. Doesn't try to blur the edges. Hates greed. This is a person that can't be bought. These are the kind of people we want leading. You know, everywhere you go in the scriptures, when it comes to leadership, you'll find this to be true, that character is at the top of the list. 
Occasionally, they'll mention skills or performance, but that's always at the bottom of the list if it's mentioned at all. You know why? Skills and performance can be learned and improved, but character sticks. And what a person is in their heart will determine how they perform in life. So character is always important. And notice, he doesn't ask if they have skills in certain ability or if they know how to judge. He wants to know their character. Will they fear God? Is God important to them? Do they love the truth and are not willing to compromise on it? And do they hate greed? That is, they can't be bought. Now let me put this into the real world in which we all live, right? We've been watching way too much news about Ketanji Brown Jackson for the last couple weeks. And all the questions that have been asked about her and you know, this side and that side and how people are being cruel with their questions and whether she's going to be voted on and approved, and that's right around the corner as I understand it. But it's interesting to me, as I was studying this text and thinking about all the questions that have come up and in the news about her, I don't remember one question asked, do you fear God? Do you love the truth? And do you hate covetousness? That is, you can't be bought. But when I think about legal qualifications... You know what kind of person I want making judicial decisions? Somebody who fears God. Somebody who absolutely loves the truth and won't compromise on it. And somebody who cannot be bought by any political side, one side of the aisle or the other, but somebody who will just do right and not do it to get a scruple or a feather in their cap, but will just do the right thing. You know, this passage is more applicable than ever in our day. Now, I understand, you know, people in Washington don't have a great deal of respect for the Bible and understand that it needs to be separation of church and state, but these are the kinds of things we ought to be looking for, if not in the Supreme Court, at least in this church. We ought to look for people to lead us who have these kinds of qualifications. Do they really fear God? Do they love the truth? And they hate covetous, cannot be bought. Great principles and God's giving them to us right here early in the Scriptures. Well, what else? We're building a team, right? We built the team. We're, we're going to have the main people do the main thing. They're going to find other men who can do the other things. And then what do we do? We give them some work. This is what I want you to do. I want you to sweep that office. I want you to wash those windows. I want you to clean those toilets. I'm going to give you some work. Look at verse 22. Let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter... They shall bring unto thee, that's to Moses, but every small matter they shall judge. You will give it to the men. You know, if you don't, you can build a team and then never give any work to the team and you still don't multiply anything. And so the work has to be dispensed and given away. Not the main thing, but the other things. Now, what's the benefit of going to all this effort? You know, and I can see almost Moses' wheels turning you know, what, why should I go to all this trouble? You know, some of us have this same thing in our mind. We're thinking, you know what? It'll take me too long to explain this to someone else. I'll just do it myself. And we all have that. So I, I think it's very interesting that uh, Jethro finishes up by giving us some benefits. Why the effort to train others to do some of the work so that we don't carry the whole weight alone is so important. And so we're going to end with the benefits of building a team. Why should I do this? And it's interesting to me what uh, Jethro sh says to his son-in-law. Look at verse 23 now, just walking through the text. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. Notice a twofold blessing here. The first one, you're going to be able to endure. It's it's the answer to the weight that we saw earlier in the message. Remember, the people are wearing, themselves, wearing out, and you are caring too much. So Jethro comes at the end and says, you know, you're going to be able to endure. You're not going to go to an early grave if you'll do this. Your, your, your own ability to continue and to survive and not burn out depends on this. Then he says in verse 23 again, peace. It'll be peaceful for the people. Look at this. All this people shall also go to their own place, their place in peace. You know, when you can breathe easier, so does everybody else around you. You know that's true, right? When you're all uptight, when you're not, everybody else just kind of freezes up with you, right? But once you can breathe easier and you can endure, then everybody around you enjoys a level of peace as well. You'll have time for people, and everyone will feel a whole lot better. 
There's actually a third blessing, but it doesn't appear uh, at, at this particular point. It appears back at nine, in verse 19 where he began his discussion. I want to go back to that and pick it up now. Verse 19, Hearken now unto my voice. Jethro is speaking. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. If you'll listen to my counsel, God will be with you. So this is an interesting expression, and we think of with, we think in proximity to. And there's nothing wrong with that because God is in proximity to you. He is with us all the time in every place. There's no place you can go that God is not there. That's a wonderful comfort to the believer, but I don't think that's why Jethro said it. When we find this same phrase used in other places in the Old Testament, it's usually referring to God's blessing resting on an individual. And let me give you some examples of this. I'm thinking of the man Joseph in the Old Testament who was sold into slavery, eventually promoted to prime minister while he was in Potiphar's house, Genesis 39 and verse number 3. The text says the Lord was with Joseph and made everything that he did to prosper. The idea of the Lord being with him wasn't just the proximity or closeness. It was the idea that God was energizing and empowering and enabling what Joseph did so it would be prosperous. We would use the idea of blessing. We see the same thing with Joshua. In Joshua chapter 1, you know, he, God's trying to encourage him, be strong, be courageous, don't fear, I'll lead you, and I will be with you. He wasn't just saying, I'm going to be, I'm going to be in close proximity, so if you need me, I'll, I'll, be, I'll run to your aid. That's true, but the expression has this idea of, I'm going to be empowering, I'm going to be energizing, I'm going to be enabling you to do what you do. So if we take that meaning from those other texts and we thrust it into this passage, which seems to be here, what the text is really saying is, Moses, if you'll get a hold of this team idea and divvy out the work to hundreds and thousands and fifties and tens, you know what God's going to do? He's going to increase the productivity, the blessing, the energy, the enabling. You're going to get far more done. That's really what he's saying. Here's Jethro, just a father-in-law. If you could be humble enough to take advice from your father-in-law, you might learn something. And here, learn the benefit that you'll be able to endure your work Peace will prevail in your relationships with people, and you'll have the blessing of God empowering your work far beyond your ability to do so. So to this day, God's work is really limited by our willingness to increase the size of the team. Did I say that right? Let me try it again. God's work is limited by our desire to build a team. If we don't build a team, then we're really reducing God's capacity through us. Now, there are many ways that this could apply. I've tried to suggest some. Small business owners, pastors, not a whole lot of us in, that, in this room in that category. Moms, there might be another. Per but let me double down on this application as I bring this to a close. Will you look for ways in this church to help build the size of the team? You know, this church could do more. I mean, God could really empower and prosper and bless this church beyond its present capacity if we had this vision of team ministry. Will you then look for ways to join the team? Maybe you're attending here, but not working here. We need some tens and fifties and those who can manage a hundred and those who can take some of the work. Or will you content yourself to sit on the sidelines sucking orange slices and filling water bottles? <laughs> so the church needs to increase the size of the team and the people that are in the fight. Are you in? Let me use a very uh, basic story that you've heard before, all right? So there's this traveler coming into town, and he's hungry, and he has no food. And he, 
solicits some of the villagers for food and none of them will participate. You know this folk tale, right, about stone soup? So his efforts to get a meal are not making much progress, so he takes out a pot, puts some water in it to boil, and puts a stone in it. And the villagers are curious, what in the world are you doing, right? And so he, he said, well, I'm making stone soup. Well, tell us about that. Oh, it's a very good soup. It's very tasty, but it would taste a little bit better if it had a little bit of garnish in it. A little, little time later, the, uh, the first villager produces a, a handful of carrots, and they're added to the soup. And you know how the story goes. You, you've heard it, right? This is not... You're, well, and then the next guy comes along, and villager, he's curious. And, and what, 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 tell me about the soup. How does it taste? And, and he said, well, you know, it would taste a little bit better if we had some potatoes. If we had some potatoes, then it would taste... And so the, then the potatoes are added to the soup. And, and, and before long, you know how the story goes. Each villager, his curiosity is aroused, and each one is giving just a little bit more to the soup. And by the end... The, village, uh, the traveler promises if you contribute to the soup, you can have some of it. And by the end, there's a beautiful stew. The stone comes out. The soup is distributed to the villagers and the traveler, and they all have something to eat because they were all willing to contribute to the pot. So what are you going to put in the soup? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to discuss your word and its challenge to us today about being part of the team so that the team can get more done. Thank you for using people in the past to teach us lessons we need today. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us. Maybe there's somebody, even this morning, under a crushing weight, might be something from business or something at home or a combination thereof, and they're burdened down. Weight is just too heavy to bear. Maybe they're almost at the point of depression. Or, God, would you comfort them today? You didn't intend for your people to live under a crushing load like this. Lord, so I pray that you'll do a work in heart. Maybe there's a mom today just frustrated by the amount of energy and effort required at home. Would you comfort her and strengthen her and give her good help around her today? Maybe there's another person today carrying a burden I don't know about. Thank you that your word is just multifaceted and able to pierce every heart and to accomplish your work. Pray that you'll do that. And may we be willing Lord, as we think about our church to move forward and, and to do more and to add to the team and find ways that we can help the team for the sake of your name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. As we continue just to think a little bit about the message today, did God touch your heart? Are you under a crushing load? Who would say, Pastor Mike, as you started talking about Moses, I felt you were talking about me because the pressure is so, it's too heavy for me right now. Would you just pray for me because I'm just under a load right now? That's all. Yeah, God bless you for that hand. Someone else say, yeah, that's where I am. I'm just under a crushing load right now. It's just too much for me to bear. Would you pray for me? Anyone else? Maybe as you, you sat here today, that sounded like good advice, but maybe you've never really been brought into the family of God. Well, you're not opposed to God. You pray and you love God and all of that, but... Maybe you've never personally received Jesus as your Savior. Would you consider the fact that to enjoy the blessings of the Bible and the blessings of God on your life today and in the future takes Jesus because he died for our sins and rose again the third day so that we could be forgiven forever. If there's another need, I hope that you'll talk to God with, about it right now. And if we can help you, that you'll let us know before you go because we're here to help. Oh, God, thank you for working in people's hearts. Continue your work. Bless us, Lord, as we seek to obey your word as you've given it to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.